Hi, I'm Rory, and with me, as always, is Ken. How are you doing, Ken? I'm excitedly with you today, Rory. I'm good. Thank you very much for asking. I hope you are well too, Rory. And both Rory and I um, are very grateful that you've joined us for the Counselling Tutor podcast. You've joined us as, as at episode 237. Three stops on today's journey, starting off with theory and practice, where we look at an element of theory and how that relates uh, to wh when, when the rubber meets the road of practice. And today we're going to be speaking about frame of reference. What does it look like from your position as the therapist? How might you see that coming into your therapy room and what can we do about that? But then going into practice partner, uh, that's where we recognize that many of us, uh, either full-time or part-time, will operate some form of private practice where we're seeing clients and uh, per perchance money is being exchanged for that service. And we recognize that to be a very lonely journey. So we uh, pop that in to kind of help and share some information on that. And today we're going to be speaking about record keeping, the importance of that within a private practice, how it differs maybe from working in an agency or an organization. And our final uh, destination today is a wonderful one. It is practice matters. That is where we kind of look at what we may come across in the day to day running of a practice. And we also from time to time take a peek into somebody else's practice, which is what we're going to be doing today. Because Rory, you met up with Ali Bate, and you discussed being what it's like to be an integrative counsellor. So that is a must listen. It's a great episode, Rory. It is episode 237. We're starting off and we're speaking about that theory in, uh, to practice of what we know, what we call frame of rec reference. Should we just start off with what is frame of reference, Rory? It's, it's, an, interest, it's an interesting one. It, was, it first came uh, to us, of course, via Carl Rogers in um, On Becoming a Person, I think in 1961, where it was first mentioned. And I think there's no better time to discuss this. We're, we're living in an extraordinary time here in the UK at the time this podcast is recorded, recorded in September of 2022. We're in, in the middle of a royal funeral, in the death of Princess Elizabeth II, uh, or the Queen, the Queen, and uh, the ascension of Charles Charles III. And... Um, through through that my day um, meeting people, I'm meeting people with very different opinions on the monarchy. I've got some people who have met some people who are real ardent monarchists, love the royal family, and I've got I met some people who are republicans. They would prefer that we had an elected president, like um, they have in Ireland or, or, or the, what's called a tea shock in, in in the Republic of Ireland, and they have very firm views either side of of that camp. Those are frames of reference. Yeah. Those are frames of reference. Those are our view of the world and a view of our situation. And I think if we could put ourselves in the therapy room and think about where do you sit on that, that side of the fence, are you Republican, are you a monarchist? What happens if you get a client who comes in who has an opposite view? Uh -huh. They have a different frame of reference. Now, Usually what happens in, in in society is that people try and defend their positions. We argue our point. We try and say, well, we're right because. But actually, as a therapist, what you're trying to do, and I think we should do this generally when we're communicating with people, is trying to find out or try to understand why somebody else is thinking the way they do. Mm. We try to get in the other person's frame of reference. And sometimes that can be a bit challenging. If it's something we don't know about or something we've never considered, we have to work really hard to try and understand the person in front of us and understand their worldview, Ken. I think that's a beautiful way of describing frame of reference. It's, it's kind of the view uh, that we construct of the world, how we see the world. And I, I think of it as like looking through a frame, so holding a picture frame up. So if you're watching us on on on. The, the podcast on YouTube. And if you haven't uh, uh, um, uh, checked that out, then do so. Go, get, get onto YouTube and just put in Counseling Tutor Podcast and you can see what Rory and I look like and the antics we get up to. <laughs> so you've got this like frame that you're looking through and that frame is made up of your beliefs, what you, your, your culture, what you experienced growing up as a, as a, as a child um, and, and the decisions that you've made in your life become your frame of reference, how you see the world. And there's a, there's a, a lovely saying that says, we see the world not as it is, but as we are. So we're kind of projecting out this frame of reference, but we call them our truths. 
you know so you were speaking about the, the the monarchy there rory you know somebody who might be for the monarchy their truth would be what a what a life of service how amazing this person is and that is my truth and anything that kind of intersects that truth or kind of challenges that truth i'm going to be quite defensive about that because mm. this is my truth is my frame of reference so we all have our frame of reference and you're, you're speaking about our client coming in and empathy is seeing the world as the client sees it as you said rory and it is a challenge it is a challenge specifically when it is not a shared frame of reference where they're not shared ideals that we might hold and i think you know we're saying this is theory into practice i think the work here rory is about recognizing our own frame of reference you know looking at how do we see the world and journaling is a great place to do that and i think that the, the challenge um, when counseling, when being with somebody else, when trying to see through their frame of reference is more about putting aside your own frame of reference. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> Cause it can jar, can't it? As soon as a client might bring something that doesn't align with your value set or, or how you see it, there can be a <gasps> inside. And that's a great indicator of, am I really in that client's frame of reference? Now, Rory, here's the thing, you know, we've spoken about unconditional positive regard before. Does seeing through the client's frame of reference mean we have to agree with that frame of reference? Well, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. And I think I think that's a really interesting mm -hmm. point. You know, you 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 might have a client whose behavior is maybe illegal or or a, or a client whose um behavior is damaging to others. And although we offer unconditional positive regard. Sometimes we might find our, ourselves saying something along the lines of, well, I, un I understand that's how you see it. Um, you know, perhaps there may be a different way. Perhaps other people may see it differently. I think I think the the, the key element here is, is not to personalise it. It, it. it moves into the area of challenge, I think, the skill of challenge. And I think it's not to personalise it, not to say, I think differently, but to say some other people may see it differently. This is what they may say and that way what you're doing is you're not um you're not putting yourself in a position where you're going heading towards an argument with your client what you're doing is you're respectfully just putting another idea in into the room but yes i think unconditional positive regard um is is the key i think to frame of reference and it's all and what unlocks what, what, what that unlocks is your own personal development. So I think it's very, very easy to feel under attack when someone has a, a real opposing view to yours. And I, I think the journey of personal development is to say, okay, we're going to put that on one side, may talk about that in supervision, yeah? But here and now with the client, I'm going to get as near as I can to how the client sees sees the world. And that, I think is is a big challenge. It was for me when I trained as a therapist, and um, I think it's an on, it's an ongoing piece of work, really. You know, mm. taking away that personalization, or you know, feeling under attack that your views, your well thought out and well rehearsed views are under attack, and just putting them on side and saying, "Let's see what you have to say, and let's see, try to see the world through your eyes." Yeah, and and I, I like how you've outlined that, Rory, and there there is. Uh, areas and and uh, allowance for challenge within that and mm -hmm. and, and uh, allowance for i don't buy in to to what you're sharing over there but i respect your right to hold that view yeah. and and when we're talking about frame of reference we're talking about how somebody is seeing the world how they're interpreting the world and their life as it comes at them and if we think about therapy it's not always about the narrative. So what we mean by the narrative, it's the story. It is the the running commentary that a, that a client will come in and they're saying this is happening and this is happening and that's happening and the next thing is happening. So there's the narrative and that's how they're interpreting the world that is in front of them through the words of that narrative. But underlying that narrative are the feelings and the feelings are universal. So mm -hmm. we're talking about frame of references, how I see and how I interpret how life is coming at me. But the feelings that are generated from that are universally felt. And it is there that we can share that deep empathy. So I'm going to use a, 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 a silly example here. I'm going to say a client who is quite angry that their 
football team lost the last match and they believe that the referee made the wrong decision and they're fuming mad about this. Now, you might not like football or follow the team or you might even be happy because the other team <laughs> won from your frame of reference. So being in that client's frame of reference is more about recognizing the anger that they are feeling, the rage that they are feeling, because within that is the universal work, the emotion that they are feeling that is being triggered by how they see and how they interact with the world. So maybe there is an element of work uh, within the therapy room that we focus on the emotions that underlie how they see the world. Because I'm seeing the world this way, it is causing me pain or difficulty in these areas. Well, we can look at that pain, we can look at that difficulty, and we can look at that with unconditional positive regard, because that we can certainly relate to. There is the same. Yeah, abso absolutely, Ken. And I think it also speaks to CPD. Oh, yes. You know, I think that if you're working with diverse client groups where their frame of reference may be very different to yours because of because of the nature of their diversity, then doing some CPD around diversity and, and understanding as a as a generalization how diverse communities may be disadvantaged or depowered within situations will give you not only an insight, a better, better way of entering that frame of reference, but also develop a deeper empathy. I think it's, I think it's sometimes we think, well, you know, I don't know what, what, what the problem is with this person saying they've, they've had some prejudice against them, but unless you're in their shoes, unless you're, unless you're they, them, you don't know. And I think sometimes just expanding our CPD, Certainly with diverse client groups, you get a, a better idea from, from a member of a diverse client group and their own experiences. It can be a real eye-opener. It certainly has been, has been for me because, of course, I travel through the life as a, as a kind of older white, white guy. <laughs> um, and, and, of course, um, we know that prejudice and, and, and disadvantages exist. And it's only when you hear it firsthand through CPD, you understand how that happens and you can build that in and that expands the ability to be empathic. Uh, I, the, the, the bit I like most about what you've just shared there, Rory, is, is that you've linked it into CPD because <clears throat> it's not our client's job to teach us about what's going on for them. It is our job to learn about that. And we learn about it through CPD rather than uh, with the client using their, their session time to go, well, what that's, what's that like for you? And how does that play out in, 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 in your life? That's not what therapy is there for. We're there to look through their frame of reference back to our topic and be with them within that. So CPD, if, if you interacting with a client that may um, have have a, have had a significantly different journey to you. Mm -hmm. um, seek out the right CPD that is going to give you an understanding, so that you can be empathic, so that you can be more aligned to that client's frame of reference. I think that's a a, a very good call there, Rory. Yeah, and I think it can. We've said this on the podcast so many times, Ken. But we meet the client where they are, mm -hmm. not where we are. Yeah, <laughs> and it's it's about meeting the client where they're at. You know, it's not who you are, it's where you're at. And um, I think that, that there's no there's no better way in service of frame of reference to try and get a, a real accurate understanding of how other people's lives pan pan out because everybody's life's different. And to be honest, to, to a great extent, I'm beginning to appreciate the term otherness. Everybody is the other. You know, your life experience, Ken, and your frame of reference is different to mine. We're friends, we work together. We collaborate, but we have two very different worldviews because we're two very different people. Yeah, very much so. And and I think this is a great topic. There is a handout uh, for this, so um, uh, make sure you get the handout. You can get that uh, by going to our show notes page, and that's very easy to find. You go to counselingtutor.com. That's our mother website. That's a good place to hang out. Lots of free articles there, specifically if you're a student or even if you're a qualified practitioner looking for CPD, it's a great place to look. Uh, right in the main menu is the podcast tab. Click on that. Find episode 237. And uh, within that page is the show notes for today's episode where we kind of put links into what we discuss. And you can download Rory's super duper handout on frame of reference from that page right over there. Great topic, Rory. Thank you for bringing it. 
Well, no problem. And it, it takes us it takes us neatly on to the next section of of our podcast, which is practice partner, and we're discussing can client records. Yes, I think it's important. This you know client records. So, we're to, what is practice partner? Practice partner is um, if you are either in private practice or thinking of going into private practice, what are the considerations? And client records is an important and maybe easily overlooked consideration mm. for working in uh, private practice. Now, if we're working in an agency, and I worked in, a, in, in an agency for, for many years, uh, there was uh, policies and procedures already in place of how client records would be collected, dealt with, um, stored. Uh, and we're not just talking about notes here. So generally within in the agency setting, uh, I as the therapist would have a requirement to take my notes and, and store those notes. But client records, Rory, I think extend beyond notes. And we learn this when we go into private practice because we're dealing with all the contact uh, of the client. And uh, I've got a little bit of... Uh, a list here of what you might expect. So it's appointments, the diary that we keep, any record of past or future sessions that may be held in diaries. How is that being stored? What kind of a calendar is that? Is it secure? Because the information in there is sensitive information. It's the client's name uh, and details that they are seeing you. Invoices and receipts from sessions. Those are records with the clients identifying details on them any form of communication any form of communication email text a voicemail that may be left that is a record it holds a digital footprint and we have to manage that by law we have to manage that contracts that that we may send that we may receive back that we may have signed and filled in um, any kind of assessment that is done, whether that be core or any assessment at all that we are doing and storing in any way is a record of the client. Uh, any interventions that we may write down on notes, worksheets, maybe diaries, if we're doing any kind of expressive therapy like artwork, has something been made? Who holds that? Where Where is it? Uh, photographs, artwork, audio, and video recordings. And there are more, but there's kind of an overview of some some of the records that we need to consider and how we manage, store, and discard of at the right time, Rory. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I think at this junction, it's, it's interesting that this comes up quite a lot in our Facebook page. Oh, yes. People asking questions about storage of records, notes, data protection in general. And if you want to join our Facebook group, go to Facebook, type in Counselling Tutor. We're a closed group, but our lovely moderator will let you in and you can join thousands and thousands of like-minded people, some students, some qualified practitioners, some tutors, supervisors, all talking about topics in the world of counselling and psychotherapy. Get in, join the party. And if you've got any questions to ask, I'm sure there'll be some knowledgeable person in there who'll be able to give you an answer. And I, I think you I think you hit on an important point. A lot of people think that records are just notes. Yeah. Just your notes. They're not. They can be anything that could that, that that form your work with the clients. And that's why we have to be very thoughtful of where they're stored, how long we store them for, how we destroy them. And um what happens if the if if these if the courts or a coroner were to ask for information, or the client themselves, you know, under the Data Protection Act and GDPR, they have the right to access their records. And I think you're absolutely right, Ken. When you work in an agency, a lot of that is taken care of for you. When you become a private practitioner, you've got it's, it's one of the number of things you have to do yourself. Your IT experts, um, PR experts. Um, but no storage and record keeping and, and secure record keeping are indeed um part of part of your work. And how long do you keep them for? Um, I mean the 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 thinking is is that we keep uh, our certainly our clinical notes for seven years or seven or seven years after a after a, a, a young child clients under 18 becomes 18. So if, if you have a so you're working with someone who's 16, you should really keep the notes for nine 
years and you have to be accountable one of the things that that therapists are more and more being asked to be is accountable can yeah and if you call to account and you you haven't done the things you're supposed to do in terms of record keeping and 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 securely uh, securing clients records you can find yourself in difficulty yeah indeed and and there's two sides to this there's the the ethical side and of course we look to our ethical uh body that we join uh and and the the framework that they would make uh, available to us to understand the ethical requirements and if we kind of overstep an ethical boundary uh, we can find ourselves um sanctioned we can find ourselves having to um explain ourselves mm -hmm. but there's another side which is maybe a little spikier than that and that is the law and it's going to depend on where you are in the world how the data protection laws are are, are managed and here in in uh, the united kingdom at the moment we work to gdpr which is general data protection regulation and it's pretty stringent on how mm -hmm data is kept, how data is transferred, how data is stored, how long data is kept for, how much data you will keep on a certain person, how that data will be handled if they ask for uh, you to remove that data, the right to be forgotten, for example, or if they ask to see the data. And if law enforcement asks to see the data, there's a whole lot of, of legislation around how that data is held. And we need to understand it. Uh, and we need to understand where the vulnerabilities on it. So number one, we're looking when we're looking at any kind of, of records for our clients, we're looking at lawfulness. We, we have to look there first because the law is not something that we can choose to follow or not choose to follow. It's not an option. It is the law. Then fairness and transparency. Then the limitations, the, 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 the purpose limitations on how long we should keep the data. So if we're keeping notes, for example, we're going to be kind of, there will be an indication maybe from our, our ethical body of how long we should keep that. But does that apply to invoices? Does, does that apply to an email that you may have from a client or a text that, that you might have from a client that may have reached out to you? How does that differ? And then there is something called data minimization data minimization is about keeping only that that is required so we wouldn't keep information or data that is surplus to our requirement just what we need accuracy of data specifically in note taking that we're keeping accurate notes not our feelings on how this client may be presenting or how they may be going through their life but what is the accurate what actually was said keeping it really focused down and then of course the uh, accountability that being accountable and this i, I don't want to put hor hor horror scares out there you know but if, if you think just on the basics of, of it, if you're keeping a online electronic diary through a service provider, um, and I, I have one, I, I use a Google Calendar, but I would never use my Google Calendar for my client records and my yeah. client appointments. And the reason for that is it is a free, Google Calendar is free to use. And when you're using it, when you're signing up to use it, you are ticking a box with terms and conditions that basically give Google the right to trawl your calendar and to look at the information stored thereon. Now, when I have a meeting with a client, that is confidential. They are coming and they're trusting that that is a confidential meeting. They might not want anybody to know. And I certainly don't want some massive conglomerate <laughs> organization in the US having that data. Um, so even just as basic as what calendar are you using and how is that managed? Who can access that? What are the terms and conditions around that? And of course, um, that's just the calendar. There's a lot more uh, in terms of, of, of data storage and how records are kept. Uh, and of course, there are practice management systems, Rory, mm. that are set up specifically for health professionals, for counsellors, for psychotherapists that do these jobs for you, where you will pay a fee. And for that fee, that confidentiality, that privacy is held for you, I guess. Yeah, absolutely, Ken. And I, 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 and I think I'd like to pick up on a point about um, using free software to store client information. 
On the internet, there is no such thing as free stuff. Absolutely not. You may get it without a cost, a, a physical payment, but where, you, why, where you're paying for it is, is that a lot of companies then will, may troll your data, may may use a bot to go over your data and um, aggregate that information and use it for marketing. I know that if I type uh, a, key, a keyword into, into my search browser, um, the next time I go and search for anything, doing some research, I get adverts popping up. Mm-hmm. But strangely enough, the thing that I was looking for, yeah. you know, the, the other day it was walking boots. And uh, I all of a sudden, without any um, a- asking for my part, I just got adverts for walking boots. So clearly um, the browser I was using was sharing my data with an advertiser. So it really is important that when you think of, storing your information, you store it in some kind of secure vault, for want of a better word. Yeah. And I, I I think there's no better way of, of kind of introducing Therapy Lock, a product that we have produced, which is a secure vault for your documents, your notes, also for making appointments, for diarizing, for sending forms out. And it's a practice management system, and it is secure by design. We yeah. built a vault. It's, it's really, really exciting, and those people who have been testing it for us have been um, delighted with both the functionality and the security aspect, Ken. Yeah. 2019, Rory and I recognized through the Facebook group that you've been invited to join. Mm. Go to Facebook, type in Counseling Tutor, come and join in. The the complexities of um, being in private practice, in, in storing notes, in uh, holding a diary that that is truly private, truly confidential. And um, it's taken us over two years of, mm. of research and development, and we've brought in developers and uh, on very secure servers um, that are EU-based. We have built a practice management uh, system. It is um, really light in terms of what it does, so it's not all singing, all dancing. It's more focused on security and privacy, where your diary is secure, where emails sent out are secure, where if you are meeting via video, it's not going through a a, a, a company that may be intercepting that, that it is secure. It is between you and the client. It's called Therapy Lock. If you're interested in it, uh, go and have a look at uh, counselingtutor.com. At the time of this episode airing, we will be very close to opening the doors. We've had it in beta test for over a year where we've had therapists testing it out. They're very happy with it, saying it's really changed the way they operate their practice. And I, I guess we're in this practice partner uh, section of, uh, of of our podcast. It's not all about being this advert for Therapy Log at all. It's more about how, think about how you're storing records. Think about how they're being kept. What are you doing with your invoices? Where are they being stored? Have you got a phone that has got uh, client details on it? Are they texting you? Are you texting them? Are there any emails in your inbox uh, from clients or to clients how is that being managed how is that being stored if you were in the uk um i would suggest getting uh go- going onto the ico website just put in ico into google and it will show up and uh, there there are little self uh, evaluation questionnaires that you can fill in that will kind of look over how you are managing keeping data and there's a lot of information that can that is stored there on how to to keep data stored in a private and confidential way to keep yourself safe uh, and of course most importantly to keep our clients safe absolutely can and one thing we've not mentioned which is crucial is if you are storing clients data even if it's a phone number or an email address on your phone or any computer you have to register with the ico you have to register and pay a fee i think it's about 40 pounds a year 35 pounds if you pay it by direct debit here in the uk and you get a you get a pin number a, ser- a serial number which is your unique identifier and i think in terms of a private practitioner i would certainly have that on my website because that gives comfort to people one of the things that people worry about is i'm, I'm going to be talking about a lot of you know private you know intimate things about myself how is this therapist 
going to prove to me that they can, you know, keep my confidence. And I think in terms of your offer, by showing that you are registered with the ICO, registered and that you've got policies in place to manage data, that it goes a long way to um, comforting clients. And I've I've had an email communication this week with a therapist who's one of one of his clients has written to him asking him very detailed questions about how they store data, hmm. how it's used, um, what's who, how, who can access it. Um, so yes, it's it's really really important. And and I guess at some point in this section we'll talk about clinical wills as well. Yes. Should you become incapacitated? Should you become unable to attend to your clients and attend to your practice? What happens then? Who takes care of that for you while you're unwell? Yeah, it's it's a lot to consider. But going mm. into private practice is starting any business is, and that's what this practice partner is about. You can do it all yourself uh, by putting the correct policies, procedures, uh, and levels of security in place. Um, if you are interested in checking out Therapy Lock, it's a really low monthly cost, and it kind of takes care of it for you. Just go to uh, counselingtutor dot com, and right there on that home page, just scroll down until you see Therapy Lock um, and the information that you need will be there and therapy lock is privacy and confidentiality without compromise mm. the app is built by therapists for therapists with confidentiality and data protection in mind so it is built into the system but there you go that is um our practice partner for today a, a, an interesting new mm. section uh, we've been getting a bit of feedback on that it looks like that uh, you're getting some value out of that and we're happy to continue to bring that uh, for as long as you are getting the value. Uh, but we now move on to our practice matters section, Rory, a really, really popular section where we look at what happens in practice, what kind of presentations we might get uh, presenting in our therapy room. And from time to time, we do what we call a, a peek into practice. It's where we get to have a look over the shoulder of a fellow practitioner at how they work and what they do. And Rory, you met up with Ali Bate on, uh, and spoke about being an integrative counsellor. I did. It's always a joy. I know Ali. Um, she was a, a fellow tutor when we taught. She taught at a different college and she's well known and, and much loved among students and pra practitioners alike. She's not been uh, too well recently, so we send all our love from Counselling Tutor to her, if she's listening. And uh, I spoke to her, caught up with her, and we had a bit of a chat over a cup of coffee about integrative practice and how she works as an integrative practitioner. And this is what she had to say. And we welcome Ellie Bates, who... Um, He's someone I, I I know, I've spent some time with it, so it's always a delight to meet people that I've met and uh, I, I value their time. And Ellie's going to talk to us about integrative counselling or integrative psychotherapy. So first of all, welcome, Ellie. Thanks, Rory. Lovely. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for your time. Now, you're an, you're an integrative um, counsellor. No, counsellor. Yes. Yeah. What first of all, what is integrative? What when we hear the word integrative, what does that actually mean? Oh, to me, um, I suppose it's helpful to look at what it's not first. Um, so my limited knowledge of of eclecticism, um, you know, to to me, it's almost like taking the best bits of different approaches and kind of um, putting them together to work with the client whereas integrative to my understanding has its kind of core base approach um but you can kind of pull in elements from other models to fit the needs of the client and um, because of, as you know everyone comes to us with um different objectives from counseling or different story or um, experience and rather than trying to kind of perhaps fit someone to your approach it's about looking at them and what they present with and then being able to have flexibility with how you work um, so it almost becomes another theory within its own right using the concepts of approaches that are already there um, it's a little bit like you know if you like cake You've always got the same 
base ingredients, haven't you? Of uh, not made a cake for a long time. <laughs> uh, eggs, flour, um, but some people might prefer a lemon sponge or a, a, yeah. a jam or a chocolate. And so it's about being able to have flexibility with how you work to meet the needs of the client, but you've still got um, the authenticity of the concepts that make up yes your integrative model if yeah, that makes it, sense it makes absolute sense and I'll pick up on a point that you you, you spoke about there meeting the needs of the client mm -hmm. I think that as therapists we shouldn't be um, trying to leverage clients into our model of therapy we should be yeah. working with yeah. what they want and, and do you find that helpful to be able to draw on a, a wide range of, of theories Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I, I am, you know, my heart and soul is with the person centered way of being fundamentally, you know, that um, the, the client has their own answers. I really believe in that. Um, and I suppose you could argue, couldn't you, that if you move away from person centered, you know, are you kind of losing that client led aspect of it? But I actually find that being able to kind of draw on other knowledge and other elements and perhaps bring that in helps in meeting the client where they are at that time. Um, it, I suppose I've only kind of, the, the longer I've been counselling, the more it's made sense to me. Um, but yeah, you know, so some clients might come in and have, a lot of kind of really self-deprecating negative thinking, um, you know, perhaps linked to shame or, you know, whatever there, there is going on for that individual. And, and so kind of drawing on knowledge of other models such as CBT, I wouldn't necessarily change what I do and start, you know, perhaps whipping out worksheets or interventions or homework necessarily as you may have with cognitive behavioral therapy some approaches of it um but i integrate that knowledge into the person-centered ethos that i believe in and i would observe those perhaps negative thoughts and kind of gently challenge and integrate cognitive behavioral therapy in that way yes and and i i think i think what i'm hearing clearly is that the base, you know, he talked about a cake and all cakes usually have a base set of ingredients. Yeah. Not that I yeah. make cakes, but, you know, um, you know, watching uh, watching people who do make cakes, uh, they have yeah. a base set of ingredients. But there's <laughs> there are other ingredients that go into to give them a uniqueness. And yeah. one, of, one of the things that I think comes over very strongly, Ali, is that it, it, the, this the person-centred base is where the relationship lives. And that's just Absolutely. so important, isn't yeah. it? That's it. Yeah, much better way of saying it. It very much is. To, to me, you know, you can kind of try or use or bring in interventions or concepts or ideas, even metaphors, whatever. You can bring that into the room. But to me, the client needs to trust in order to unpack. Yes. Um, and so that relationship's really important. But also from, because my integrative training is person-centered psychodynamic and, and, and CBT. So it's also the relationship between myself and the client in the room can often mirror relationships outside of that room or historic relationships. And so again, the psychodynamic knowledge can be useful to explore that. Yeah, and, and manage the transference and the counter transference. Yes, and, yes. and and yes, and and I think I think I'll pick up on another point you made. You said your training was integrative. So mm. when we're thinking about being an integrative therapist, what do you think is important when we come to adding a different theory to our repertoire, if you like, or our toolbox? Um. Well. If you can you imagine if you went into a restaurant and you asked for some soup? Um, I don't know, <laughs> I've not had a bowl of soup for a while, leek and potato. 
and someone came and served you this bowl of soup and I don't know what goes into it you've got an onion like literally just an onion on a plate on a bowl um a potato what else a leek a leek yeah (laughs) um you know you wouldn't necessarily perhaps want to eat it in that way but when it's put in a blender and it's blended up and you know it's got the a little bit salt and pepper and um suddenly it becomes this new thing doesn't it comes more appetizing yes definitely so in answer to your question i i I mean this is just my view of it but i think it's important not to kind of jump from one place to the other where it can um i suppose lose the efficacy of what you're doing um, yeah, not to kind of not to kind of sit there and think, oh well, I'll, I'll just do a bit of CBT now. I'll, I'll just drop some yeah. psychodynamic in. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll just I'll just I'll just do a few. I'll just do a bit of empathy there. Um, yeah. uh, you know, it, and I think the soup analogy is a good one, isn't it? Someone turns up, drops you a plate, and it's got an onion, a leek, potato, and some water mm. in it. And they say, there's your soup, and it's like, well, it's not actually soup. What it is, it's it's three different things put yes. into a bowl the blend yeah. is is the is that that's the whole skill set of integrative isn't it how it's yeah. blended and how it's presented yeah absolutely in terms of training um a lot of people mm-hmm. may just go down a single modality route which is fine they may usually it's person centered mm-hmm. certainly here in the uk um if yeah. someone wants to add in a skill set what would you recommend would you recommend they read a book or watch the video or what would you recommend to be able to competently practice another idea? Mm, that's a it's a good point, and you know I think to me, kind of learning the person centred way and training that way, it's very it's very beautiful, and I, and I do believe it's impactful and it's enough for change to happen. Um, but you know, I, I have kind of heard from some people over the years who said, you know sometimes it's I found this a bit limited or I'd like to have a bit of knowledge about this and this um to me I've always found you know like CPD workshops um really useful you know where you kind of go and have an introduction to mindfulness for example um and then you can maybe integrate some of that knowledge to fit into your approach and there's loads of great things on um YouTube um yes reading but I think interventions are are really useful um or you know creative interventions art therapy you know perhaps if you kind of go and try that out and learn how to use it it might be a good way of bringing that into your practice yeah so things like things things like workshops CPD, mm. I like I like the sound of CPD because we should all be doing at least thirty hours a year, if, if yeah. not more. And and also, I, I don't know if if like myself, if I'm thinking of introducing something into my practice, I usually run mm. it past my supervisor first. I'd say, yeah. thinking of you know, I'm thinking of doing you know some trauma informed work, which I'm which I'm writing a course on now, and. I, I would say, you know, how how do you think I should how do you think I should do that? Do you think collaboration when using and being collaborative and getting peer feedback when you're using a new modality is useful? Oh, absolutely, because um I mean that's what the super, supervision's relationship's there for, isn't it? To kind of have that as a sounding board and um perhaps, you know, what is my motivation for wanting to bring this in and how might I go about doing that? Um, I suppose it's just another checkpoint to make sure that it's um, perhaps done in the right way and you you feel confident and go into it kind of knowing your reasons for that. Yes, I like like the sound of reasons because I think sometimes Mm -hmm. as a supervisor, you you meet supervisees sometimes and they say, oh, well, you know, I've, I've kind of, I don't know where to go with this. And it's easy to bring in an intervention, isn't it? It's easy yeah. just to say, oh, I'll just do a bit of CBT yeah. or I'll do a bit of a psychodynamic life script matrix map. Um, but sometimes you have to look to yourself. I don't know if this is in your practice and say, actually, you know, am I, am I trusting my core model enough? <laughs> really? I, I agree. And I, I used 
think that reminds me of, um, I suppose, my main time at Riverside was where, uh, you know, I had students for quite a long period of time there because it was a long course. Um, and I'd noticed, so we, we built up a good rapport and relationship. And I, I did notice that, um, you know, a lesson when we perhaps say, right, we're going to try this out. Um, so we did, we touched upon Gestalt as part of one of the modules, for example. Um, and one of the, the techniques is the empty chair technique. Mm. So we talked about that and we gave it a try. And then <laughs> you did notice there's a potential tendency for, you know, every session then becomes an empty chair. Let me try this out, um, which, you know, is understandable. But yes, it's about coming back to kind of asking yourself and and what is my reason for this? Does it fit? Yes, it, it absolutely. And as Maslow famously said, if, if the only tool you you have is a hammer every problem becomes a nail <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah no I, I absolutely agree absolutely and um, I've noticed that myself because um you know over the years I have uh, seen the value more in um young yeah. and we'd not really um learned about that on my training and not that I necessarily, you know, do anything and become this Jungian counsellor, of course, but I have to kind of notice that, you know, perhaps I can see within the client, for example, um, these ties to the past. And, you know, it can be helpful to kind of offer an observation, but I still have to remember I need to meet them where they are. Ah, yes. The, yes. You know? that, yeah, Absolutely. And I, I, I think that that's it, isn't it? Meeting the client where they are is yeah. important and not, and not sometimes being dogmatic in terms of your, your modality. I think sometimes you know, if yeah. a client wants something specific, then yeah. you, you have to ask, am I a good fit with, yes. with the skill set I have? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for me, that's, that's where integrative, for the way I work is... Uh, I see it as quite fluid. You know, it's almost like, okay, you've got these this knowledge or this learning from these three different camps, if you like. Um, but it, it, it's appropriate if you have a client who perhaps is coming with, um, you know, grief that just needs to kind of speak. You know, I'm just going to meet them there and, and you know, I'm kind of more rooted in the the relationship the person-centered way of being the listening um I'm not going to kind of jump in because I love Carl Jung you know yeah. it's um it doesn't make sense so it's about kind of being mindful I guess of the person that you're with absolutely and I wonder if there's someone listening out there uh the listener mm. um as we euphemistically call the listeners the listener um if if <laughs> someone is listening and they're, they're, they're person-centered trained and they're thinking yeah. I'd, I'd like to get I'd like to become more um, integrative what would you say would be the first step would be well where, where would where would they go or what do you suggest they may think about um it's a really good question that actually um I suppose returning to yourself for a minute and kind of going, well, you know, perhaps what is it that I think might be useful to bring into my practice? Um, you know, what, what if anything, is, is there something missing or perhaps something I've noticed, a pattern of what people are bringing, you know, um, what, what am I interested in? What do I want to look into? Um, and then perhaps knowledge around it, first of all. Um, me personally, I'm a visual learner so I like to uh, uh, kinesthetic I like to do yeah well so I, I personally love the value of kind of going to a you know like a, a day introducing a specific theory or approach or something you can integrate into your practice um, and kind of living that if you like experiencing it myself um, and then I like to kind of think about maybe even you know exploring supervision just how could I now fit this into how I work? Yes. Into my philosophy. Yeah, so so a strong area of reflection. 
reflect, mm. you know, taking the new idea and reflecting it and saying, yeah. where, where would that, where would that live in my, in my kind of repertoire of counselling skills yeah. or awareness? And, yeah. and also I've, I think what I did hear you clearly say is find, find out what interests you, you know, yeah. what, 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 what drives you. Um, because I think that's always where the best learning is. If, if it's something that really interests you, then you're more likely to, to be able to stick with it if, uh, if it becomes mm-hmm. a bit difficult, I would imagine that would be the case if you're if you're looking at Jungian Jungian psychology because yeah. it is quite um, in depth, isn't it? It's been lovely talking to you, Ali, about the world of integrative psychotherapy. So, Ali Bate, thank you very much. Big thank you as always to Ali Bate for being a guest on the podcast, sharing that peek into practice. And thank you again to you, Rory, for kind of uh, hosting that. This has been the Counselling Tutor Podcast. We're so grateful that you joined us. It's been episode 237. Yes, we started off talking about frame of reference, our unique worldview and how we have to think about that when we're working with other people and try to get access to their worldview to better understand not only their story, but also the emotional subtext around it. Then we moved to practice partner where we talked about client records and explored the depth and importance of client records, how they should be stored and uh, what a private practitioner really needs to think about um, when moving into self-employment or, you know, working, working on their own. And then finally, we caught up with the lovely Ali Bate, who spoke about being an integrative counsellor. And as always, stay grounded and stay safe. <laughs>